uh, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member Ember, Emmer, and members of the committee. Thank you for having me at this briefing today. I'm honored to speak with you about the functions of blockchain technology and financial services and to answer any of your questions. My name is Danelle Dixon, and I'm the CEO and the Executive Director of the Stellar Development Foundation. I've been in this role and working in blockchain for the last 16 months. Prior to that, I was the Chief Operating Officer of Mozilla, the maker of the Firefox browser, where I spent my time focusing on the intersection of business, technology, and public policy. In both of these roles, I've advocated for and highlighted the importance of privacy, net neutrality, encryption, the need for openness and interoperability in technology, and fostering competition and creativity on the web. Today, in my role at SDF, these policy issues remain an important focus, as there's a need for openness and interoperability in blockchain so that we can foster competition in our space, as we did in the early days of the web. The Stellar Development Foundation is a non-stock, non-profit corporation. We have no shareholders, we have no owners, we have no profit motive. We are not a charity, we pay state and federal taxes, but our structure allows us to be beholden only to our mission, which is creating equitable access to the global financial system. We look to accomplish this mission by making money more fluid, markets more open, and people more empowered through the use of the Stellar Network. Our work at SDF is broad, and yet our folk, and we are focused on this technology stack. We shepherd the code base for the Stellar Network. We support the growth of the ecosystem and the use cases built on top of Stellar. In addition to supporting public policy and education around Stellar and blockchain generally. So what is Stellar? Stellar is an open, permissionless, decentralized ledger or blockchain network that is optimized for payments. There is no single entity, including SDF, that controls the code base of the network or its growth. You don't need permission to use the technology. It's just like the underpinnings of the internet. It's open and ready for your use. The many third parties building, innovating, and growing the network are a testament to our open source background and are the source of financial innovation and inclusion. Using Stellar makes it possible to create, send, and trade digital assets backed by nearly any form of value, and to do so in a compliant matter, manner. The network interoperates with the traditional financial system to leverage the benefits of blockchain technology to enhance, but not supplant, existing infrastructure. The Stellar Network has been operating for over five years, and today the network processes over 2.5 million daily transactions with over 4.5 million accounts. So as members of this task force have likely heard, there are countless applications for blockchain technology within the financial services sector. I wanna focus my comments today on just one, and that's payments, particularly cross-border payments. The World Bank estimates global remittances totaled 714 billion in 2019. For seven countries last year, remittance inflows accounted for more than 20% of the GDP. And according to the UN, 800 million people, that's about one in nine globally, are supported by funds sent home by migrant workers. Unfortunately, remittances remain expensive and slow. According to 2019 data from the World Bank, the global average cost of sending just $200 across a national border is around 7%. So many people and economies are dependent on high cost remittances that the UN created a sustainable development goal to reduce the per transaction cost of remittances to less than 3% by 2030. So this is where blockchain can help. Sending any transaction across a border on Stellar, whether the value is $2, $20, $200, or $2,000 is fast. It takes less than three to five seconds on average, and it costs fractions of a cent. To give the task force a live real world example of how Stellar creates this equitable access to the global financial system, I'd like to focus on Nigeria. It's the sixth largest remittance market at over 24 billion annually. So Kauri, it's a regulated FinTech company in Lagos, Nigeria, provides cross-border payment services for the Nigerian market, and that's powered by Stellar. By tokenizing the Naira and integrating with the Nigerian Interbank Payment Network, Kauri developed payment rails that enable low cost and instant payments into and out of Nigerian bank accounts. So their product, which is called NGNT, a digital asset that is backed one-to-one -one fiat Naira, 
is available on Stellar today for cross-border payments and digital asset exchange. Now, Cowrie plays an important role providing access to Stellar in Nigeria. But then there's another anchor, we call them anchors, these financial institutions, that's on Stellar, this one in Europe. It's a fintech company called Tempo that issues digital assets backed one-to-one -one by the Euro. So with Tempo and Cowrie as endpoints, Stellar enables payments between the EU and Nigeria that are completed in three to five seconds, nearly instantaneous, nearly free to the developer. And there are built-in compliance tools on Stellar that allow entities building on the network like Calorie and Tempo to complete the Know Your Customer, the KYC, and anti-money laundering AML steps required by their respective regions. So this generalized asset issuance toolkit that's built into Stellar includes the ability for the issuer to take in the required information before issuance or redemption of the digital asset. So it empowers them to meet their compliance obligation. This functionality is built in at the protocol level, as tokenization is a fundamental part of the network. So the supporting code is reliable, it's vetted, and it's fast. And when the digital assets work together, as they do in the Calorie Temple Tempo example, converting fiat in Nigeria into a digital asset, sending those assets to Europe, converting that digital asset back into fiat in Europe, and ultimately depositing that fiat into bank accounts of businesses in Europe, a connected global financial infrastructure is created. That's how interoperability comes to life. And that's what makes Stellar and blockchain a powerful technology. Remittances are a core use case for Stellar and expanding the network of anchors, these financial institutions, building on Stellar is one of the ways we seek to create this equitable access to the global financial system. In addition to, to accessibility, Stellar's technology could go a long way to, toward achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goal. So as you consider these type of policy objectives, I want to make myself and my team available as resources to the task force. And I'd love to know how the task force members are thinking about remittances, payments, and digital assets. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Danelle. And, and I can assure you that uh, you know, we've, we've been looking at that issue of, of remittances and, and uh, uh, on that note, I would also uh, like to introduce our chairwoman, Maxine Waters, who I think it's, it's fair for me to say, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, one of, the, one of the most attractive parts of this, this whole idea of blockchain and, and uh, you know, different platforms, Ethereum and others, is that it holds the possibility of banking the unbanked. And uh, as uh, Neha and others have, have, have acknowledged in their remarks. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, our chairwoman, Maxine Waters, the general lady from California for her remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Lynch. I'd like to thank you for holding this briefing and for your leadership of the committee's uh, FinTech Task Force. Um, blockchain technology has great potential for innovation in financial services, and it is extremely important that this committee continues to explore the various potential benefits and risks uh, in its use. While cryptocurrency is one of the most well-known use cases for blockchain, chain technology. I look forward to hearing even more from this panel about other and more inclusive ways uh, to utilize blockchain technology. I just uh, came in on the hearing a little bit late, but I was able to hear how it is being used in Nigeria. That's very impressive. I was also able to understand uh, how we could reduce the cost of remittances, which I think is so very important. And don't forget, in my district, that is 46, 47 percent uh, Latinx. We have remittances that are going out every day uh, to many of the uh, Latin countries. And so I'm very, very interested in uh, this uh, cryptocurrency period, blockchain in particular. And uh, again, I thank you, Chairman Lynch, for all of the effort that you're putting into it. You're our leader, 
and we're looking for you to bring this to us and help us move uh, at the right time uh, in the right way. Thank you so very much. In some cases, could be made better by legislative certainty. So could you speak to that? Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, uh, it, I think that this is the, an issue with respect to clarity on the securities classification. I think it only helps with respect to this market and it only helps with respect to the new players that are coming to it. You know, we didn't do that. That's not how Stellar came to life. That's not, uh, we don't, we didn't have an ICO. We don't have any of those things. Again, the profit motive is very different with us, but there are really exciting players that are coming onto the market and there's a lot of fear with respect to classification issues. Uh, and so we are losing some innovation because of that fear. And I think that creating some stability around these issues would, and just cl and clarifying the issues would make it so that there are bright lines and there are rules uh, that that are uh, that that players can know that they need to follow as they enter this environment. So I think in general, this is just a really nice step to take. Yeah, thanks for that, and and kudos. You definitely have a clearly different organization structure, and I think it bypassed all that. So. Uh, it's really exciting and it highlights the the ability to do things with blockchain and payments and the speed. I love that you highlighted how much more efficient this is than our current architecture. And, you know, as is recognized, we have large uh, incumbents with huge stakes in seeing the status quo preserved. But a key part of this is, uh, you know, technology does disrupt things. And a key part of it is, are we going to use this financial system and uh, whether it's the securities law or, you know, uh, Federal Reserve uh, regulation or our whole banking system as a system of control, or are we going to use it as a system of empowerment? Are we going to use money as a tool or as a system of, of for, for trade and commerce? Are we going to use it as a system of control? And, and so as China moves forward, they're clearly using it as a system of control. Uh, and the United States and our free and open society, we really have the possibility to do this in a way that has less central control, but actually more secure. So Neha, I was just curious if you could talk about true distributed ledger technology and maybe how uh, Bitcoin as an example goes about security versus something with a traditional, uh, you know, uh, relational database or something like SQL database would go about security and how much more secure is that versus, you know, a fixed point. Uh, security system look like here's how you control the digital key that the court uh, has access is control over that allows it to reverse transactions and are there reference implementations that have that or if I, is this just too much of an anathema to to all of the bitcoin crowd that they just um you know they haven't really conceived of this so, so uh, thank you for the question. I, I don't know that there is anyone out there that is de that figured this out and that the particular issue that you have identified there. I will say that if we look at uh, just, I'll, I'll raise two issues. First of all, with respect to assets in specific, there are compliance controls that an, an issuer of an asset, for example, on Stellar could put in play with respect to the digital asset once it's sent. So if you could put controls around not only uh, which type of entities that it could get sent to, if they've already been KYC'd and had their AML put in play, uh, when they have to go through that process, for example, um, and then you could, that asset holder could reverse transactions should they keep that as part of their compliance space. Uh, that doesn't get to the point about a trusted third party, but it does offer the ability for asset issuers, for example, in a CBDC situation to be able to do that. Um, and then the other thing I, I want to point out is that the, the immutability of the blockchain itself and the fact that the financial institutions that actually hold the assets on the edges, they are regulated. They have to do KYC. And if you just take that Twitter example from recent where there was the fraud on Twitter where they were able to uh, trace within I, some certain some small number of days who the asset, uh, who held the assets and who, who uh, committed that fraud, it was 17 days. Um, that was a pretty remarkable thing and only allowed because of the immutable nature of blockchain generally. That's right. But split the baby between having one, one entity, a regulator um, with complete access uh, versus a regulator that has limited access with a cryptographic barrier uh, so that they can't sit there and ask, you know, how much did you spend at that store at this time? Um, is there anything happening in that in that yeah, space? Thank you so much for the question, uh, uh, Representative Foster. We uh, we see a lot of great innovation and competition with respect to this. We're already seeing what we call those who analyze the chain. 
So chain analysis is one of them. Elliptic is another one. Elliptic is uh, uh, does that for Stellar. And they can actually pull out this kind of information from the chain as the transactions are going. Uh, and and I, I I just have to say one other thing. I think wash trading not is not always detectable, but there's definitely uh, litigation around this already in um, blockchain when you do have wash trading that happens because you can watch the transactions and see what's happening and, and why the transactions may have taken place. Um, so yes, there's a lot of innovation here, and I think they'll continue to be. The beauty of it having uh, in happening in the private sector is that there's going to be competition, and competition breeds even better innovation and creativity with respect to these issues. And so I'd love to see these third parties out there doing this in the private sector.